Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a special guest with me, Pierce Crosby, who's the general manager at TradingView. Pierce, great to have you today. Tony, thanks for having me as always. Happy Friday. So Pierce, I'm a big fan of TradingView. I, of course, use it for crypto and stocks. But let's start with your background. Uh, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually from a tiny town in, in Northern California, uh, population, I kid you not, 333 people, wow. um, born and raised, um, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my nearest neighbor was a quarter mile away. Um, so not anywhere like, like, uh, living in New York today. Um, but, uh, grew up there 18 years, um, moved to Santa Cruz, California to go to university of California. Um, and then moved to New York to go to Columbia for, for grad school. Um, but love California, you know, uh, do or die California. And it's been 10 years now in New York, but I still, uh, I still call it home somehow. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, that's pretty, I, I can't even fathom or imagine just 300 people. <laughs> such a yeah. Um, well, you said you grew up in New York. I mean, 300 kids within your block, right? right. I mean, uh, total, total polar opposites, but uh, somehow we both end up in the same industry, I guess. For sure. Um, so what did you do before working at TradingView and how did you end up at TradingView? Um, well, so I, I, I kind of bounced around a little bit. I mean, uh, my my initial background was in was in politics and um, working in the state of California. Uh, but you know, working in the state, you realize how slow things move. Um, I quickly wanted to switch gears into a place that's kind of more high turnover. So I uh, came to New York to basically become a, a financial reporter, and I worked at uh, I worked at Thomson Reuters for for some time. Um, for the uh, Breaking Views desk, which uh, focuses on hedge funds, asset managers, uh, M&A, and um, investment banking. And so uh, I, I covered a lot of hedge funds, a lot of um, private transactions, a lot of mergers and deals. Um, but it's a great way to you know quickly kind of immerse yourself in an industry is to be kind of the fly on the wall and, and learn everything there is to know about um, the investment landscape. So totally different than politics. and. Uh, I encourage you know anybody uh, who's interested you know to kind of uh, you know be a journalist and, and follow it because it's definitely a passion for for those who are you know really kind of interested in, in writing and, and learning. Um, but I mean, I'm definitely not a great writer. I'm okay, but ultimately I could tell that you know my kind of longevity in writing was uh, was going to be uh, was going to be limited just based on you know the industry is kind of compressing overall. So. Um, in 2013, I, uh, I quit and I, I joined a startup called uh, Stock Twits. Um, and, and for those who don't know, uh, it's, a, it's a chat platform, basically a social chat for uh, investors and traders to, uh, to kind of communicate and, and talk about investing. Um, not dissimilar from, from TradingView, but, but much more focused on just kind of real-time chatter, um, probably very similar to the Wall Street bets of today. Yeah. Um, it's a great kind of, you know, background and great way to get started in the industry, um, just to kind of cut your teeth and be the first employee in New York. So the company was based out in California, and um, I was the first New York employee. So boots on the ground, just kind of building the business from scratch and, um, when I joined, yeah, we were roughly six people. Um, and we grew that business to about 45 employees, um, pretty strong revenue. And funny enough, they're, they're quite substantially larger today. Um, you know, it just happens that the industry has changed a lot and they just happen to have inherited a lot of that business over time because, you know, everybody's investing, everybody's stuck at home. So, um, they're doing, they're doing quite well. Um, even though I, I moved on to trading view. And um, yeah, about three years ago, um, I met the team at TradingView and uh, got really excited about what they're building. Uh, it's really a globally scaled product, and we'll get into a lot of that in, in, in the near future. But um, yeah, I just really excited about building a global business and, and working kind of all over the world. And um, yeah, so fast forward to today, here we are. Awesome. Um, so I have to ask, because my my audience is you know primarily crypto uh many do invest in stocks as well but primarily it's cryptocurrencies so when was your first encounter with bitcoin or any other crypto and what was your aha moment that you know this is something that is legit it's here to stay and, and uh, you know what are you holding your crypto portfolio as well 
Um, so my first aha moment, um, I have to give to Fred Wilson. Um, I had the pleasure of, of being introduced to Fred in, in 2016. Uh, we threw a conference um, at my old company, Stocktwits. I, I kid you not, it was actually called Stocktoberfest. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a great event. Um, a lot of people that went in the early days were crying, trying to figure out like this whole social internet plus investing. And so you'd get a lot of interesting names from, from all over the industry, um, crypto as well as um, you know, equities traders, FX traders, and then you know, private equity hedge funds this whole mashup of people is really interesting. So, so Fred got up on stage and um, at the time he just invested in, in Coinbase, um, I think the year before. And, you know, he, he really didn't know, you know, much about where the industry was going, but he basically said, listen, I don't know, you know, uh, broadly speaking, where we're going to be in 10 years, but I'm putting 5% of my net worth in this thing. And, you know, I'll just see what happens, but I just need to have that much to at least, you know, give it a chance and see what happens. So I followed Fred um, and uh, I guess the rest is history. Um, so really kind of dumb luck, really. Uh, but, you know, if you surround yourself with people that know more than you, you know, chances are you're going to ride on their coattails. And uh, so that was probably, I mean, you know, 2017 and 2018 obviously was uh, kind of a, a, a great time to be to be part of the crypto sphere. Um, sure. Obviously, you know, a huge boom and, and bust cycle. Um, really fun and, and uh, learned a lot. And I, I kept a lot of my crypto because at the end of the day, um, you know, I thought of it purely as a long term bet. Um, I know a lot of people that made tons of money, you know, on the first run up and then sold out and called it a day. Um, so yeah, I definitely took losses on the way down as well, but, um, but safe to say, you know, most of the stuff that I've kept has, um, has come back and, you know, I don't get too crazy with, you know, all these altcoins and kind of the, the whole DeFi world, which we can go into. I'm sure it's a super topical thing right now for you guys. Um, but, um, but for the most part, I think, you know, holding, um, uh, the major exchanges and corresponding stable coins are safe bets. I don't think that they're going anywhere. And um, for various countries, I think it's very important to have a stable monetary system. And so everything that backs into that, you know, as a store of wealth is is kind of where I focus my interest when it comes to crypto. Um, with a lot of these other things, um, whether it's, uh, you know, um, the DeFi world and all this, um, small bets for sure, um, in terms of my overall Kind of portfolio but um yeah I, I really do still think that as a store of wealth you know the long-term kind of strategy is to you know allocate 80 percent of your portfolio to things that you know are going to be around sure and then 20 percent to things that uh you know risky bets you'll see what happens and and people right. keep air dropping me all sorts of stuff uh but uh <laughs> i don't know if any of that's ever going to pan out right you know as soon as they find your wallet address it's crazy how many people just want to capitalize on that but um but uh yeah i mean nine out of ten of those are going nowhere i assume sure uh let's talk about trading view um for those who may not know and I, I, you know can you give us a quick overview of the company and its services yeah, so um, so TradingView has been around for nearly ten years. Um, before uh, the founders started TradingView, they actually um, had another company called MultiCharts, which is a desktop trading software um, built, you know, primarily for futures traders and FX traders. Like, if you if you ever see those stock images, like on on uh, any kind of stock image platform where the guy's got forty screens and you know he has like that's actually usually running multi charts. Um, so that's their, that's their kind of uh, initial claim to fame. So the, the thinking of trading view was um, take that DNA of like really caught like hardcore trading tech and make it all web-based. So do away with all desktop software. Cause that was kind of like the nineties and the early two thousands and make sure. it all web-based. And, and that's really how trading view came to be is um, just a web-based charting platform. Um, you know, fast forward to today, I mean, we're, we're the 68th largest website in the world. Um, you know, we have businesses in, in 180 countries um, in terms of paying customers around the world, um, over 350 employees, and um, 
growing at about 100% year over year. So it's um, definitely been a wild ride. Um, and, and we benefit a lot from obviously the crypto industry because uh, I actually looked it up. I don't know if you ever used the Wayback Machine, but yeah. um, the first the first blog post that TradingView did on crypto was in 2013. Wow. When they pulled in a, a, a data feed from Mt. Gox um, back in way back in the old days. And uh, I think it was the first data feed that what they were pulling in for crypto. They obviously, have, they have stock data, futures data, FX data. Um, but the, the first data feed from, from Mt. Gox went live. And uh, yeah, so safe to say they've been early adopters um, from the get go. And the idea being is, you know, how much data can we um you know power for for uh for individual customers to kind of visualize markets that's really where it's at is you know how much data can i consume and then ultimately that informs my decisions um in a positive way so um yeah i mean we do a lot for the crypto industry i think that um, in addition to tradingview.com we also license all of our software to other platforms as well so if you're a customer of Binance, if you're a customer of uh, uh, OKX or FTX or um, blockchain.com, I mean, literally all these people use our charts um, inside their own platforms as well. Um, and so by doing so, we kind of have, you know, our core business, which is, you know, uh, subscriptions for individual customers. But sure. you know, if you if you want to use Binance, so be it. But we're still going to be your, your go-to charting package there. Um, and so we're kind of powering most of the the crypto uh, industry, whether whether it's charts or um, or you know retail subscriptions. Sure, and I remember reading about uh, your integration to Gemini Exchange with the Win Winklevoss Twins Exchange, of course. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool that you guys are you're you're almost everywhere now in all these major exchanges. That folks can leverage the, the, the technology and, and the charts and all the things that you provide. Yeah, I mean, uh, folks like Gemini are great because um, uh, what they realized early on was that we have this huge audience, tradingview.com, and um, the best way for them to get out, you know, to the retail customer is to, uh, you know, basically connect their trading APIs so that if you're on tradingview.com, you can actually log into your Gemini account and then trade directly from tradingview. Um, they were actually the first crypto exchange to um, to make that integration happen, um, but safe to say not the last. Um, so we uh, we definitely have a lot of uh, upcoming um, releases that we think will be pretty substantial for various markets all over the world. Um, and the way that works, just to be clear, is uh, Gemini's you know registered primarily in the U.S., so they list their services here. But if we were to work with a crypto, you know, exchange in in the Netherlands, you know, they could list their services there. And um, what's really cool is we actually run um, about twenty five language versions of TradingView. Awesome. So if I if I was in Japan, um, I would actually see a completely different version of TradingView than you know when I'm sitting here in New York. Um, and people don't really realize that that there's actually all these separate networks that are growing independent of each other. Whereas people think, you know, oh, it's just a retail trading website for for U.S. stock investors. Well, actually, no, it's it's 25 sites all over the world. Um, whether you're, you know, speaking Portuguese or speaking Chinese or Japanese, um, there's there's a completely separate site for you. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Um, so tell me about the traffic and demand you guys have seen since the growth of the crypto market. Obviously, it's just over 10 years old. Uh, you mentioned 2013, you guys had published a blog post on it. Um, have you started, you know, in addition to stocks and the other items that you provide, have you started yeah. seeing like an influx of traffic as the bull market's taking off right now and that type of thing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, so obviously I look at this data all the time. It's my, it's my, um, my responsibility, I guess, you know, as the GM. So, um, so if you look at traffic and revenue over time, um, probably, one of their biggest um, early success stories was was early crypto. So 2016, 2017, um, you can see a huge upswing in overall traffic and almost overnight um, traffic doubles um, over the course of a year. And that was more or less attributed, probably 80% of it was attributable to crypto specifically. Um, 
And so, I mean, fast forward to today, uh, crypto is about a third of our overall business. Um, and, and what I mean by that is um, we obviously have retail subscriptions. You know, TradingView is free, but for those who want all the bells and whistles, you know, you can get a, a TradingView subscription, costs you anywhere from 14 bucks to 60 bucks a month. And um, so a third of that total business is, is attributable to crypto. Um, you know, people trading crypto first, they can be multi-asset, but, but that's what they designate as their, as their primary. Um, so no doubt, I mean, uh, crypto and, and us are, you know, kind of working hand in hand in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, when, whenever we list a new exchange, there's, there's a ton of kind of press around that because, um, you know, people understand that, you know, getting their data into TradingView is now a competitive advantage because, you know, you can market that to the larger world knowing that um, you know, millions of customers can now see um, whether it's your futures product or your uh, you know, spot products or, or what have you. So we have kind of a, a cute, like a line out the door of people who want to now integrate their data to TradingView, um, which is so interesting because back in the day, it was literally our CTO and a couple developers like crawling the web for, for data sets just to get some kind of information on this stuff. Um, it, it's a long way since then, and, and, and they've done, you know, a really incredible job to kind of pull together as much information as possible. Um, but we have about 25 exchanges connected today to TradingView in terms of their data feeds. So um, we pull in futures data, every kind of data you can possibly imagine. But um, for crypto specifically, yeah, I mean, it, it, the more the better. And, you know, you could look at the deltas between say uh, Bybit and, and Binance to, um, you know, try to, you know, understand what's the difference in price for various assets. You know, today there's a lot of market makers obviously that play in the space. So, you know, those, those deltas are, are hard to come by, but, you know, we think again, the more data we can actually bring together, the more efficient we can make the market overall. And it's, you know, kind of, I don't know, it's a bit like, um, it's good for the industry to have a lot of competition. Um, otherwise you just have huge kind of spreads and in, in overall tradable markets and, and people can get ripped off pretty easily. Um, so we think the more data, it'll actually create a lot of transparency around, around kind of crypto pricing. Um, whereas, I mean, I think, you know, when, when Mt. Gox was around, it was literally like, okay, well, I guess this is the price. I can't really compare. There's nothing to like actually show me. Um, sure. And that was like the best thing that you're going to go off of. So, um, the more competition, the better in that regard. Now, there's quite a, a lot of cryptocurrencies and digital assets, and it seems like almost every week there's a new one. You know, what's your plan on... Every week. Every yeah, week. Oh, yeah, every, right? Hours. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you know, what's the plan as far as your roadmap to add more cryptocurrencies? Obviously, you want to add the ones that um, are getting adoption, a lot of trading activity and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the roadmap look uh, for, like, like for that? Yeah, so um, so we try to stay pretty far ahead on the kind of um, you know sphere in terms of understanding what's tradable and what's not. But um, for for crypto, you know, we have to be very careful um, around what we list because um, you know, as you and I were talking offline earlier, um, when when things um, get listed on on TradingView, they can move um, significantly. And so we have to be very cognizant to that because you know we don't want to play an active role in, in um, you know changing market prices. Um, sure. So for the most part, the way we run things today is um, we actually work with the exchanges and the brokerages, and we rely on their data feeds um, to actually power our systems. Um, we have redundant feeds from a, a bunch of uh, data aggregators as well. But, but generally speaking, we use their lists. So their spot lists, their futures lists, um, their options lists as kind of the uh, bedrock of what is listable on TradingView. And, and the reason we think they're a pretty good indication as to what, what's a fair trade is that they basically have to make markets on this stuff. And, and ultimately um, what we hope to do is empower investors. So we really think there's a lot of value in just listing as many coins as possible if there's nowhere to trade it. Um, so if there's no market for it, um, you know, what's the value in having it on trading view, right? Um, and so for the most part, we, we, we kind of rely on them to, to pick and then um, we utilize their kind of choice as, um, as an indication of what's tradable. Got it. Now, I want to ask 
and and I know a lot of things are probably under NDA. You're waiting for your PR pushes and things like that. Uh, any hints as to what we could potentially expect, uh, you know, along the lines of crypto later this year? Um, well, uh, so for we're doing a couple things um, in terms of what I what I can disclose for sure. Um, the on the educational side of things, we're doing a lot for crypto and. Um, what I mean by that is we, we've actually brought on an editorial team at TradingView. Uh, people don't know that we actually have writers that are, that are doing the, the hard work of um, researching, uh, actually looking into new assets, et cetera. And uh, what we started doing is actually aggregating timelines for various assets over time. So uh, one of the most popular one is obviously Bitcoin. We launched that about three months ago. And uh, it's a chronological kind of indexing of Bitcoin's history. And we call it a timeline because it literally, uh, you know, we overlay it on top of our charts. But this thing goes back to the beginning of, you know, when, when the initial white paper was actually launched. Um, and so um, we're, we're launching a lot more of those for a lot of existing currencies. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, what we're trying to do there is really just educate um, new customers that are coming in the door and not get super you know, in the weeds with these really edge case, um, new coins or new tokens or what have you. Um, but really, I mean, you gotta think, you know, today we have something close to 20 million uh, monthly active users um, using TradingView. So many of these people have never experienced a cryptocurrency. They have no idea where to start. And right. so we really are building a roadmap for them um, while also building for the really hardcore guys that are, again, looking at the deltas between uh, Bybit and FTX or something like that, right? Um, so that's the one end of the spectrum we built for the, the really advanced traders. But in terms of a lot of our focus on crypto, it's actually road mapping people to get up to speed so they can literally just get started um, because people don't really even understand the difference between an Ethereum contract and, and what, a, what a Bitcoin actually is. Um, okay. So, um, so that's a lot of the near-term roadmap. Um, in terms of you know partner releases, um, uh, I could definitely say stay tuned. Uh, there's a big one coming up uh, in April um, that we have uh, scheduled to launch in terms of a, a new trading integration. So that'll be joining. Um, and uh, before the first half of the year, we'll have a couple of big exchanges that'll be um, coming online for for TradingView, but. Um, but I think that that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, we don't really do a ton of new products like from Square One, because we found you know a pretty good niche in terms of what we think of as a you know healthy, sustainable uh, you know, business. Um, so really, it's kind of like refining like a rough cut diamond. That's the way I think of it. Or I don't know if you saw that movie, Rough Cut Gems. Rough cut, rough cut gems, uncut gems, uncut gems. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so it's like we have most of the guts there, like most of the DNA of like a really hardcore trading platform. Now it's kind of making it more accessible and easy to manage for, for the average investor. Um, but, but rather than launching whole new products from scratch, we're really just kind of focused on refining what we actually do for, for a much broader spectrum of, of customers. Well, I'm very excited to uh, for those respective uh, releases as to integrations and partners and so forth. So that's awesome. So let's talk a bit about technical analysis. Um, it's something that um, it took me a while to understand and how to study markets. And, and that's one aspect of it, but also just a core part of it. Um, and that is you know, your business model is essentially based around that. So can you Tell, give us a, a, an overview of why technical analysis is important for those who may not know much about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's great about technical analysis is that, um, and yes, I mean, so a lot of our product is built around technical analysis, um, we're obviously expanding the spectrum of, of, um, of those tools, but, but technical analysis is basically the study of um, charts. And, and really what you're doing is looking at human behavior uh, expressed in financial format. Um, and what I mean by that is that when you look at a simple chart, um, you know, the price moves up and down on any given day and you might say, okay, well, that seems pretty random. Well, in reality, that's actually a reflection of thousands of people that are trading on a single asset and that's what moves the market. So at the end of the day, you deconstruct a given asset. It's actually just tons of people either believing or not believing 
uh, in a given uh, currency, commodity, you know, stock, uh, cryptocurrency, et cetera. So, so really it's it, human behavior is, is what technical analysis backs into. And what's interesting is that um, in, the, in the stock market, technical analysis is a component piece of investing, but there's a ton more emphasis given to fundamental investing. Whereas in the crypto markets, um, you know, on a daily basis, there's not a ton of news. Uh, there's not a ton of releases. And so the majority of actual trading that's done um, when it comes to technical analysis is really, or sorry, when it comes to cryptocurrencies is technical analysis. Um, and that's because people are looking at human behavior and who are the participants in a given market and really just trading the variations of, of, that, uh, of that flow data um, that they see over time. So, so really what we do at TradingView is we, we, we try to just um, aggregate as much information as possible, display it back to you, and then allow you to kind of analyze that and dig into the actual um, you know, chart patterns, formats, um, indicators, oscillators, all these different things that indicate um, some specific behavior that is happening in the market um, that may be an opportunity to invest or or um, or to sell a position or something like that. Um, so it, it's it's really cool because I mean it applies to all markets, but in in crypto it's 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 the predominant trading strategy. Um, and I think that that's really why our product has hit really uh, a soft spot in the heart of a lot of crypto traders because it's a uh, it's the best way to possibly, you know, have an edge on any given day um, is to have really advanced technical analysis um, by your side. You know, a lot of people think it's, you know, extremely hard to get into, but what's cool is on TradingView, we have all these people that are actually sharing this, you know, data and information in real time. And so uh, it's it's kind of awesome that, uh, that they have that capability to, um, uh, yeah, to basically share, you know, uh, with their friends, um, you know, different indicators, oscillators, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of combine the power of um, large numbers and you can really learn a lot from from various traders on the platform um, in a pretty short period of time. So yeah, people share their indicators and oscillators, people code up their own. We have a proprietary trading language um, called Pine where people are coding their own trading strategies from scratch and then sharing that uh, information with the community as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's basically a network of of analysts kind of working around the clock to um, to do advanced TA and um, yeah, it's it, it's definitely part of a uh, investing strategy for sure. Well, I, you know, not saying this because I'm interviewing you, but I do love the platform. <laughs> um, yeah, that's how I really learned technical analysis. Um, you know, before crypt investing in cryptocurrencies, I never did any TA and uh, yeah. using your platform. I love the fact that the community uh, centric move there where people can share their data because I've learned from other more experienced traders. So that's been really great. Yeah. No, Scott, Scott Melker is always my favorite um, Wolf of All Streets because um, I mean, he, he was a trader before crypto too, but he just happened to be the right place, right time. And, um, you know, we were pulling in data as fast as possible. And here he was, you know, charting, analyzing, et cetera, in real time. And I think a lot of early adopters um, of TradingView had a pretty significant edge in the crypto market because other people were, you know, looking at their phone and, you know, yeah, well, it looks cheap. And like, that was the extent of analysis, you know, before there was an actual platform for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely um, thankful, I think, for a lot of the early adopters of crypto because, um, yeah, they, they, they broadcast, you know, the platform more than we do. I mean, they shout it from mountaintops because it is, you know, it's funny. I think of it kind of like, um, kind of like, you know, for for designers and like, um, who would you call it? More like uh, production people. So Adobe has an amazing suite of products, right? Hmm. And if I'm an advanced, you know, uh, designer or uh, artist, you know, I have to have Photoshop. It's yeah. like, it's how I run my business. And in the same way for a lot of folks, you know, TradingView has become that utility that you just have to have if you're gonna actually analyze markets. Um, so I always think that that's a great analogy because if we can be that bedrock of, of how you do successful um, investing, um, then it feels great for us, right? Like we've done our job and we can allow you to do your job. Absolutely. Um, 
something I want to ask you about, it's along the lines of a question I asked earlier about the traffic and, and influx of traffic that you're seeing. You know, this past year, a lot of people were home. Uh, they got into trading on the stock market, Robinhood, and then we had the GameStop short squeeze situation. You know, what, 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 what is your take on that? And have you seen traffic as a result of that? Because people are like, oh, yeah, I could study the charts as well as look at the fundamentals and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's a double edged sword. I think that, you know, since, well, for about 10 years now, I've been really interested in the power of crowds and, and really kind of focused on um, empowering the individuals so that they could actually be better than, you know, just hiring a financial advisor and calling it a day, right? I don't think anybody really gains anything personally if they just, um, you know, throw their money at some guy and, and, and hope that uh, he can, you know, make you some money in, you know, 50 years. Um, so the broad thesis is that, you know, I think the power of crowds is, is, a, is a really good thing um, because, you know, what it says is that we can learn from each other and actually trust in one another to, um, to be successful. Um, you know, fast forward to today, um, it has definitely spiraled out of control in, in some regards. And, uh, you know, uh, I think people that want to take investing actually seriously will will take it to that next step. And, and often they'll come to TradingView because, you know, again, we're, we're more of kind of a long term thinking platform rather than, um, you know, capitalizing on some of the some of the mania. Um, but I mean, I'll tell you, I, it's hard not to watch things like GameStop and be like, oh, my God, this is incredible. I mean, it's literally just the power of the Internet you know, coming after, um, you know, stodgy old hedge funds. And, uh, and, you know, you can't not like, you know, root for the little guy in that sense. Um, I think that it's a bit disingenuous in the sense that it's, the system is inherently kind of weighted in the favor of these kind of big money managers, because, you know, they can push around stocks or push around uh, currencies um, much more than, than an individual investor can. Um, so it's kind of like this, this specific case is not like a repeatable strategy over time, but I think that this moment has been really eye-opening for a lot of people because they realize that, you know, even though they may not, you know, participate in a short squeeze, um, every single day, they can't, they can't actually learn a lot from just like being on these threads, being on these channels. And, um, and I think that that's a big eye opener for for a lot of folks that you know otherwise wouldn't be investors. And then, you know, the only reason I think that this whole GameStop thing actually really came around is that we also happen to be in a in a global pandemic, and and people are locked inside, and there's no sports. You know, I, the sports are definitely coming back now, but right. but the idea, you know, for six months or so is really nothing to do. Um, and, you know, you're getting your stimulus check and the whole model was, you know, stimulus straight into Robin Hood and then, you know, OTM options and just like, you know, throw it against the wall and, and hope for the best. I think that, again, those are not really repeatable approaches that, and I definitely would not condone that for anybody, but, but it just goes to show that like people are really wanting to learn how to invest. Um, you know, they'll burn themselves a couple of times, but um, ideally they'll do it in a small enough way that they can actually come back. Um, I mean, the best way to learn investing is to try it and, and to actually be a participant. Um, I mean, I always condone that. I've blown up a couple of times myself when I was younger. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it truly is one of the most, uh, well, I don't know. I just, not, I never thought I'd see it, you know, working at Stocktwits, um, you know, we created this whole kind of environment of social trading. But uh, who thought that, you know, 3 million investors would gang up on a hedge fund? I mean, that's, that's, yeah, it's, it's just light years of where I had, uh, we thought we were going to be. Right. And I feel like it's analogous of the crypto movement of decentralization and how the internet has offered or dis disrupted many centralized entities and, and ways of doing things. And now things are becoming more decentralized. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, no, totally. I mean, it, once people realize that they're they're the ones that actually have the power, um, you know, then they will actually start um, gathering and, and doing something about it. Um, you know, it applies to anything, whether it's politics, whether it's financial markets, doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it's all it's all just the combined wisdom of of the crowd. Um, it's a great book, by the way. I don't, I don't know if you ever 
um, had a chance to read it. But um, yeah, it was, it was written in the 1980s and basically talking about kind of crowd behavior and crowd mentality. But it, it applies specifically to markets so perfectly because um, it just goes to show, you know, it, it starts as a whisper, becomes a rumor, becomes mainstream, you know, uh, blows up on CNBC, you know, market explodes. And then, you know, the same thing happens on the way down, right? Um, but uh, but it's a repeatable behavior and, and we see it in, in all markets. Um, for crypto, I think it's, it's really cool because ultimately people are starting to realize that you know, the intermediary historically in the financial world has been a bank or an asset manager or an, an investment advisor. And they're realizing they can actually do these transactions themselves. There's no need to have a middleman. And in a lot of cases, when previously you'd go to a lawyer, you'd put something into escrow. And then, you know, in a month's time, you'd turn that over. And ideally, you would get a mortgage or a house or what have you. And, right. and the idea that all of that can be done actually without these additional parties involved is um, is super empowering. I think that people are really starting to get that. And again, if if you combine that mentality across millions and millions of people, um, naturally asset prices kind of, um, you know, reflect that. It's just a matter of, you know, adoption over time. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see what the future holds and how things become more decentralized. Um, so I want to ask you uh, about your thoughts on the crypto bull market and Bitcoin, you know, crossed over 61,000 and uh, we could see a higher highs. Who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens. And we see Elon, you can buy a Tesla now with Bitcoin. He's got it on his balance sheet. We're expecting other companies to yeah. do it. What is your take on the whole situation and as well as the future of the crypto market? Well, you know, I care less about the price and, and more about the adoption um, for sure. And, and I think folks like Elon have realized that they can capitalize on both where it is a store of value, but there is also potentially price appreciation. Yeah. Um, and that's a great place to be as a CEO. If you can see long-term value in terms of you know, wealth accumulation, but also potential upside from an investment perspective, you know, that's, a, that's an easy bet. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, where I really hope this does go and, um, you know, this recent bull market, I mean, it's, it's been a little bit quiet for a couple, for a couple of weeks now. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is, you know, due to the fact that, um, larger equity markets have sold off. Um, the dollar has been much stronger for, for quite some time and, and interest rates have, have spiked, um, quite a bit and all, all these markets impact each other. I think it's very important that, that people in the crypto world understand that you know they don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, liquidity is limited uh, on a global scale, and the lower the interest rates, um, you know, the higher the liquidity ratio, and the more liquidity in the system, the more it sloshes into the edge of the system. And right now, you know, uh, as it is today, crypto is at the edge of the financial system, um, and so it makes it much more um, compelling to invest in these edge case um, securities because you know, your comparable interest rate is going to be so, so low. Right. But um, I mean, with that said, I do think that a lot of people will realize that, you know, there are, you know, some kind of near term spikes in things like the dollar and, and interest rates. But um, broadly speaking, um, around the world, there is a continual narrative about, you know, uh, printing more money and, and really kind of uh, distributing more um, kind of individual checks, uh, as well as um, checks to kind of uh, offset a lot of the, um, well, I mean, a global pandemic that basically shut down the entire world for a year. I mean, it will take a long time for that to really fully um, kick in. Yep. And um, in the interim, you're having a huge glut of, um, of uh, dollar bills being printed and, and basically being distributed to, uh, to folks all over the world. Um, and and that's uh, that's a boon for uh, for other assets because you know basically there's a finite amount versus an infinite amount, um, and so relatively speaking, I think long term, it's safe to say that um, that uh, you know crypto as a finite asset becomes more um, you know kind of in demand over time versus uh, you know as we could see already you know the interest in in the U.S. dollar is. Um, has its limitations and ultimately it's reflected in price. So I think a lot of treasury um, departments inside of um, corporates are thinking about this. I mean, we've talked to quite a few ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we specifically don't have plants and 
you know, nobody needs to keep asking me that because I get that question all the time. Uh, but in terms of, you know, our, our thinking, I think that, um, I think that, you know, for sure, uh, any kind of corporate treasury uh, has a, you know, function of, you know, hedging their, you know, exposure to a given currency over time. You know, when you're talking about global corporates that have, you know, businesses all over the world, you know, they just have to mitigate risk because they have, um, you know, shareholders, they have um, pensions that they have to watch out for. And so uh, this is just naturally an additional potential hedge that, that they can hold against um, things like the dollar or, or things like corporate, corporate bonds, um, as well as, as treasuries, which um, uh, historically have been kind of the, the main store of wealth. But as we can you know, see, not just in the US, but on a global scale, you know, um, uh, interest rates on a relative basis have gone to near zero, if not into negative territory. And no corporate treasury is going to want to hold a negative territory, you know, Japanese bond, if they can hold Bitcoin and you know expect a 10% return year over year. I mean, that's that's just a no-brainer. So, uh, so I'm really excited to see that kind of adoption curve kick up. I mean, we've seen it a couple places, but but really in kind of these early adopter Silicon Valley type companies, whether it's Elon or Square or PayPal. Um, so I think slowly it'll it'll start to ripple out to the larger's, um, whether it's industrials, conglomerates, um, and in different parts of the world too. I mean, it's really only started in the U.S. maybe a year ago. Um, so you know, on a global scale, you know, Treasury departments aren't exactly the fastest moving, right. um, but safe to say, over a certain horizon, they will move in that direction. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and I'm excited to see who's who's going to jump in next and. We've heard talks about Apple's or Google's or Facebook's. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Hard to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, w- w- final question here before we go into rapid fire. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on NFTs, which are booming right now. And <laughs> some of these valuations are, in my opinion, a little bit crazy. But I think it is uh, the future and, and the digital world that we're headed to. Uh, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I... Am a big fan of of the metaverse, and I love the idea of um, digital assets in general. Um, so, whether or not you know some of these specific assets maintain the the scale of, of value that they currently hold is is definitely a question. But but um, yeah, acquiring digital assets I think is is just getting started, and 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 what that means on a longer time scale is that you know we may very much, you know, have kind of a double, a double experience or a double life in, in some way where you have kind of a digital self and a, and a physical self. Um, but uh, the NFT landscape is, is really interesting. And, you know, where I see it, you know, near term being extremely valuable. I mean, I think the metaverse stuff is, you know, still 10 years into the future and we have a lot of hardware problems in terms of actually getting there. Um, but in terms of near-term value from the NFT world, um, I do think that um, the idea that a, a, an artist can now actually maintain their value um, for for a much bigger horizon, um, whether it's music, whether it's um, you know digital art, uh, physical art, um, I think that all of those are are great near-term kind of uh, beneficiaries of of this kind of boom. Um, you know, just like any Gartner hype cycle, right? I think right now we're at that initial curve and then there'll be a fall off, but then yeah. the actual adoption curve will will rebalance itself over time. There's no doubt that, you know, I was looking just yesterday actually at, a, I kid you not, there's a project called Crypto Corgis where you can literally yeah. buy a Corgi on, on chain. And if you don't buy them a certain amount of time, they die. And like, so it creates this whole inherent mania so people are buying up corgis and I was like looking at the price of these corgis like this isn't real there's no way and some some guys buying it for for 10 eth which is you know last i checked i mean it's like 17 grand for for just a piece of code that sits on uh, a, on a blockchain and like how is that how is that sustainable long term there's no way but somehow somehow people are are buying into it and and i don't know it, it's it's somewhat mania um, but i think that people are getting interested in the core concept that you can, you know, more or less securitize anything. Um, And that, that, that is the core um, innovation that I think people are are definitely adopting. But 
I mean, I love the idea that um, a musician now doesn't have to deal with a record label, a distribution label, a recording service. I mean, I think uh, Blau has been like a, a huge proponent of, of this for, for a long time. And Scott Melker as well is, is a huge proponent of this, used to be a DJ also. But um, the idea that, you know, an artist may get 10% to 15% of total royalties by the time, you know, an album is actually shipped um, because there's so many middlemen that cut them down um, basically to zero. And the idea that, you know, today they could ship something on chain and, and more or less every time that's resold, they still get a tiny percentage of that, of that proceed. Um, and, and that in itself to me is, is huge for the artist community, which historically speaking has always been, you know, shortchanged because they're not business people, right? They're artists. And, and so the fact that they now have a competitive advantage um, is, is a huge thing. I really do hope it actually translates to the physical art world. I don't know, I have like a, a painting from my friend and, you know, I love the idea that, you know, I would never sell this, but if, if I could actually buy an artist's painting, you know, on chain and they would send it to me, but then I would also own the securitized contract around that. Right. Um, I think that that would be really the next step for me to see, you know, cause I, I love physical art as well as, as digital art. So um, to have both would be, would be really cool. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's safe to say that it is, it's definitely an eye popping experience, but but most of you know crypto. I mean, it, it really is kind of the the sign of a bull market, right? If you're if you're buying corgis for seventeen grand on <laughs> on chain. So, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know who's doing that, but it doesn't make sense to me. But to your point, the the technology, uh, the, the problem, it, this this whole security uh, tokenization and so forth solves. It's going to be just really great in the future and, and solve a lot of problems. Uh, quick question off the cuff. Uh, is trading view looking at anything related to nfts marketplaces tracking prices anything along those lines uh it's safe to say it's too early to to uh to to disclose but um uh for sure we on a personal level we have a lot of people who are interested in it um whether or not that actually comes to fruition um still up for debate um but yeah Got it. Um, so I want to wrap it up here with some uh, rapid fire questions, such as what's your favorite food? Mm, favorite food has got to be tacos. I'm from California, born and raised. And uh, we actually have like a bit of a rivalry between Northern California and Southern California. I actually think Northern California tacos are better than Southern California. People, people will lose their mind if they hear that. But um, but I encourage people to um, to go to some of the taquerias up north because, you know, uh, a lot of people that, that come to the United States from Mexico um, just, you know, settle in, in L.A. And, you know, but the folks that actually make it up to Northern California, I'm like, yeah, you've you've like actually you've made the journey, you've made the distance. And um, yeah, I, I love tacos and I'm obsessed. Absolutely. In New York, it's really hard because I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's a couple of shops, but um, but um, few and far between. Sure. What's your favorite musician or band? Oh, this is a great question. I mean, it, it changes all the time. Um, but uh, right now, I think um, Polo and Pan is, has been um, a really uh, a great experience. I, um, I met them uh, two years ago, and uh, they're a, a French DJ duo um, that, uh, that, uh, they're just really great. It's a it's a very upbeat sound, um, and French DJs in general have have a have a, a storied career. Um, you know, way back I was a, uh, a early early Daft Punk um, oh, yeah. groupie basically, and uh, you know it's it's really sad timing because obviously they've they've broken up. So I've I've recently kind of redove back into a bunch of French DJs, and um, Polo and Pan's been. Um, been uh, been great yeah I'm a, I'm a big music guy so i think you know this is actually probably like one hour in my day where i'm not playing music <laughs> in here yeah that's awesome uh favorite movie oh favorite movie um children of men it's actually pretty dystopian i don't know um if anybody's <laughs> seen it but it's uh it actually got banned in the u.s when it launched because wow. it was uh kind of uh too out there and kind of this uh alternate reality but um Children of Men, great film. Awesome. Uh, favorite book? Favorite book. 
like current or like uh, of all time? I guess all time. Yeah. Uh, so Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles mm. is is an all time favorite. I think when I was a kid, I read that book maybe once a month, wow. um, and uh, it it's they're short stories, basically vignettes um, about Mars, and and it's funny now because Mars is very in vogue, but. I mean, I, I grew up on sci-fi. I was literally like just uh, an internet junkie that that uh, read a lot of sci-fi. And um, yeah, it, it, it basically just tells um, kind of, yeah, just like small stories, not really about anything, just kind of like about life. Um, so it's almost like Seinfeld plus Mars. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm obsessed. It's a short read. I encourage everybody to read it. Awesome. And when you're not working at TradingView, uh, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Uh, well, so I just got back from California. And so every day after work, so my schedule there was, um, you know, wake up at the crack of dawn and, and, and work until, until markets are closed. And then um, I get a couple hour window. Um, so in California, three hours behind New York. So great opportunity to go outside. And um, I'm, I'm an avid surfer. So I'm usually in the water straight after work. Um, and then basically back on and burn the men out all. But um so I'm either either surfing or here in New York, there is still some surfing, surprisingly enough. Um, uh, I, we have a, in our friend group, we have a, a couple people that have cars. So it's it's great to just pal around and find interesting surf spots. So usually I'm doing that. Um, what else am I up to? Uh, taking care of my plants. There's a ton of... Uh, there's a ton of like small mindfulness things to uh, to get up to during a global pandemic, um, but yeah, I mean, usually you can find me uh, doing some kind of outdoor activity or. Oh, really, that's it. I mean, I don't. I, I try to spend as little time as possible indoors. For sure. Well, Pierce, uh, pleasure chatting with you, and I'm looking forward to the updates that are coming for TradingView. And uh, I love the platform, so keep keep up the great work there. And uh, many of my viewers and listeners watch uh, use the platform as well. So thank you, and uh, hopefully we can chat uh, sometime again in the future. Sounds good, Tony. Thanks for the time.